concentration um, of cortical nephrons. This would be a cortical nephron, even though it's nephron loop does descend a little bit into the medulla, right? And juxtamedullary nephrons. So when we talk about the function of the nephron loop or the loop of Henle, we're focused on the juxtamedullary nephrons, okay? Because that's their whole purpose is in changing the extra cellular or interstitial environment of the medulla. So both cortical and juxtamedullary nephrons have their capsule, their proximal and distal convoluted tubules in the cortex. We never find any of those three structures in the medulla. Okay? Several of you have asked questions about the efferent arterial, what it does. So remember in the cortical nephron, the efferent arterial is going to become the peritubular capillary. The juxtamedullary nephron, the efferent arterial is going to become the vasorectum which is this vessel coming down here and coming back up again, not the horizontal, those are just regular capillaries. So the proximal and distal convoluted tubule of these juxtamedullary nephrons still have peritubular capillaries, that they'd be the same as this, all right? So they'd be peritubular capillaries formed by efferent arterial from higher up. So they're still gonna have that reabsorption secretion capability and interaction with the peritubular blood. But we're going to look at the nephron loops next. Okay? So what have we done so far? We filtered the blood and created the filtrate with water and ions and glucose and amino acids, no proteins, urea, uh, maybe a little bit of uric acid. And then that flowed into the proximal convoluted tubule. And we modified that filtrate by reabsorbing back in a normal situation all the amino acids, all the glucose and about 80% of the sodium ions, okay? In the distal convoluted tubule, we have hormonally regulated reabsorption. Remember the aldosterone we talked about? So if we need to increase the volume of the blood, aldosterone will cause additional sodium ions to be reabsorbed in the distal tubule. The role of the nephron loop is to set up an osmotic gradient and the interstitial fluid of the medulla. So here is again the cortex and the medulla. And on this diagram, you can see the increasing osmolality. You guys know what osmolar or osmolality is referring to? We use the term osmotic pressure. All right, if you have a, a mole of um, glucose and a mole of sodium chloride, which one is going to have the higher osmolality, or will they both be the same? They're both moles. If I take a mole of glucose and dissolve it in a liter of water, and I take sodium chloride, what happens to the sodium? Let's just have a mole, let's just change it to 100, part, 100 mo uh, molecules of glucose and 100 molecules of salt. The glucose doesn't, it stays as a molecule, right? The salt is going to dissociate. So now instead of 100 particles, I have 200. That doubles their osmolality. So osmolality is a relationship of the number of particles in a given volume. The lower the number of particles, the lower the osmolality. The higher the number of particles, the higher the osmolality, all right? So because sodium chloride dissociates into two ions, it's going to have a higher osmolality, even though we started out with the same number of original particles, all right? So the purpose, the function of the nephron loop in the medulla is to form this osmotic gradient, to increase the osmolality of the interstitial fluid in the medulla. Normal blood osmolality is 300 milliosmol, all right? And we find that osmolality in our filtrate as well. So the filtrate of our proximal convoluted tubule coming down into the medulla. And this will be the separation of our 
cortex and medulla. The osmolality of the filtrate is 300 coming from the proximal convoluted tube. Okay. The osmolality in the interstitial <coughs> fluid in the cortex is also 300 as is our blood. The osmolality of the filtrate leaving the medulla and going towards the distal convoluted tubule is 100. So you might say, well, that's not concentrating the filtrate because it's even more hypoosmotic. All right? It's isoosmotic here because it's the same as blood. It's hypoosmotic here. It's a third as many particles. Well, what do you think happened to those particles? The reason the filtrate is hypoosmotic is because the particles were pulled out of the filtrate and are now in the interstitial fluid of the medulla. Okay. Notice the difference between the two is 200 milliosmoles. We use active transport pumps to move those particles out, and the maximum gradient that they can sustain is a 200 milliosmolality difference, milliosmol difference. And yet, if we look at that gradient, we go from 300 to the tip of the medullary papilla at approximately 1,200 to 1,400. It's usually given as 1,200, but you'll find um, the maximum is, is given as 1,400, right? So now let's look at our, our large picture. And this ascending limb is going to eventually form the distal convoluted tubule. And the distal convoluted tubule is going to attach to the collecting duct. Collecting ducts start in the cortex and extend down to the medulla, through the medulla. All right. And so all of this is forming our medulla. So it's going to be in the same interstitial environment, milieu, as what surrounds the distal, I mean the, the nephron loop. This is a gradient, so it's going to go from 300 to 400, to 500, and so on. And this is the purpose of the nephron loop in the medulla. The, per the, the nephron loop of our juxtamedullary nephrons is to create this gradient. So a couple of things are important. The ascending limb. is impermeable to water. It has sodium active transport pumps. So when we move sodium out, normally water follows. That's what happens in the distal convoluted tubule, okay, under the effect of aldosterone when we move sodium out. In this case, when we move sodium out, water stays behind. That's how we get a hypoosmotic solution. Because we're getting rid of the ions, but we're keeping the fluid. Right? What we use with these ions is we add them to our gradient. The descending limb is permeable to water. <coughs> Bless you. And slightly permeable to ions and urea, uh, but not as much as it is to water. So water will come out of there. Now, if we're pulling water out, that's going to end up diluting our gradient, right? If we keep pulling water out, we're just going to dilute our gradient. 
especially as we pull water out here. So let's see what happens. This is our collecting duct. And let's say that you didn't drink very much water. You haven't drunk anything since yesterday at, at noon. Okay. And so the filtrate coming into our collecting duct is hypoosmotic at 100 and milliosmoles. Do we want to let all that dilute filtrate pass into the bladder as a dilute urine? No. We want to return that water to the body. And the hormone ABH that we've talked about in the past will add water channels, those aquaporins, to the cells of our collecting duct. Now, as this dilute filtrate passes back down the collecting duct, back into the medulla, the saltier, higher concentration, there's also some urea in there, is going to pull water out. So 100 is going to equilibrate with the 300. Just water, salt's not going to follow. Okay, so just the water's going to go out. This is now going to be 300. It's going to equilibrate with the 400, and then the 500, and then the 600. So enough aquaporins are added, we have a filtrate that's a concentration of 1,200 milliosmoles as it drips out of the papillary ducts and into the minor calyx and forms our urine. So where is the filtrate concentrated? In the collecting duct. The purpose of the nephron loop is to form that concentration gradient, not to actually do the concentration, because obviously it's hypoosmotic when it leaves. Okay? So the nephron loops that are in the cortex don't do this. It's the nephron loops that are in the medulla. Now, there are certain animals that live in the desert, such as the kangaroo rat, that can concentrate its filtrate and its urine to 4,000 milliosmoles. The anatomical reason that they can do that is the length of their nephron loop. So if I need to really concentrate, I've crashed in the desert, I you know, only have a, a one day supply of water, I cannot increase my filtrate concentration beyond 1200 or 1400. To do so, I would have to grow my nephron loops longer, okay? And that's about as much possible as growing another leg to help me walk out. Okay, it's just not going to happen. But in their genetics, they have that capability. So now let's see how this works. This is not the anatomical display, because obviously this distal tubule should be over here. Okay, just to point that out. And so what we have, this is actually the reverse flow. The descending is on the left and the ascending is on the right. But here we have our 300 milliosmol from the proximal convoluted tubule descending. And the ascending sodium is pumped out. In response to that, it pulls water out of the descending limb, very similar to our collecting duct. In both locations, that water coming out of the descending limb and the water coming out of the collecting duct can completely dilute our gradient. Hits the vasorectum. The purpose of the vasorecta is to remove that fluid as it's being pulled out of the nephron loop or the collecting duct to maintain the gradient. Okay. In both cases, the vasorecta have a countercurrent flow. The nephron loop has a countercurrent flow. Do you remember the term countercurrent? from reproductive biology or, or testes. How uh, we have the testicular artery wrapped around the tip with the pampaniform plexus and the venous blood coming back to the core of the abdominal pelvic cavity and the arterial blood going out and a countercurrent flow that maintains the heat exchange. All right, so these, both these sets, the nephron loop and the vasorecta have a countercurrent flow. In addition, the nephron loop, using these pumps, 
functions as a counter current multiplier. And this is essential for, for changing, increasing our osmolality fourfold, even though our pumps can only maintain an osmolality difference of 200. Right? Because of this counter current flow with that loop for it flows back against itself. It's not just two, you know, it's not like two lanes of traffic going by each other because it loops back against itself. That creates a multiplier effect. So let's take a look at how this happens. You have this image in your lecture notes, which is a really just a series similar to the next one that I'm going to show you side by side. And this is online. So what we've done here, this came from a different textbook that I made my own slides. And here's our nephron loop. Again, this is the reverse pattern. So that this side is the descending limb, and this side is the ascending limb. So remember, the ascending limb is impermeable to water, and the ascending limb is where we have our sodium pumps. Okay? The descending limb is permeable to water. So we set this up, we fill the nephron loop with isoosmotic filtering. Okay? We removed the amino acids and the glucose and all that. We did that in the proximal convoluted tubule. And now we're ready to set up the gradient. So we turn on the pumps in the ascending limb. The pumps are going to pump out sodium ions, or it will follow passively. But water will not follow. And remember, maximum difference between the two sides of the cell, inside the cell and outside the cell, is 200 milliosmoles. So we pump 100 out. That adds 100 to the 300, leaves us behind with 200. And there's our maximum difference. Okay? Now, water can leave the descending limb. So with a higher concentration of salt and some urea in the interstitial fluid, and this would be on both sides, not just in the middle, water is pulled out of the descending limb, and that's going to concentrate that to equilibrate with the interstitial fluid. And excess water goes into the vasorectum. Okay? So we just move this up. And now we have a higher osmolality on the descending limb and a lower osmolality on the ascending limb. Not quite to 100, all right? And not really a gradient yet, just higher. Notice that the descending limb has equilibrated with interstitial fluid, both of which are 200 milliosmoles higher than the ascending limb because water can't leak. All right, so now let's turn this, the faucet on let a little bit more of this filtrate move to the ascending limb. We'll bring in some more of our isoosmotic filtrate from the proximal convoluted tubule. And then we'll turn our pumps on again. Same thing, 200 milliosmol difference. Add 100, that makes it 500. Remove 100, it makes it 300. This is now higher than this osmolality, so it's going to pull water out of the descending limb. It's going to equilibrate, and we do that. Now we're starting to see a little bit of a gradient. It's going from 300 to 350 to 500, right? Let a little bit more flow through. Notice why the counter current becomes a multiplier, because we move it from this side to the other side. Turn the pumps back on again. A little bit more of a gradient. Okay. Finally, this is what we end up with. The longer the loop, the higher this number can become. Okay. This is the role of the nephron loop, is to create this gradient by having the descending limb ion concentration flow into the ascending limb. We turn on the pumps, move the sodium out, that pulls water out of the descending limb, and that higher concentration of particles then moves into the ascending limb, and we do it over again. 
the vasorector removing that fluid as they were pulling it out to create that concentration. So again, the nephron loop doesn't concentrate the filtrate because it's, it's hypoosmotic when it actually leaves the nephron loop. But it sets up the gradient so that when the fluid now passes through the collecting duct, if the need arises and we add those water channels, those aquaporins, that gradient can work to concentrate the, the filtrate. Okay, so we're going to stop there. We'll go over this again on Thursday. All right. Um, and so this morning, um, I gave them about an hour to review and study for the quiz. We took it at about at 11 o'clock, which would be just about uh, 4 o'clock for you guys. So we'll start to check with you guys about tip tail and see how it's going. So this quiz includes all the structures that we talked about on Thursday. So the skeletal muscle and so as major and quadratus lumborum the blood supply to the kidney, into low bar arteries and arcuate arteries, afferent arterioles, and deferent arterioles, peritubular capillaries and phasorecta, the parts of the nephron, so the capsule and the proximal convoluted tubule. We added a few things today, all right? So you should be able to identify photocytes, again, from the models, not from the histology, the macula densa, and the juxtaplomerular granular cells of the afferent arterioles.